Hi, my name is Stephanie Hertz, Marketing Director here at Workforce Retirement Community. Workforce is the premier sponsor for the Lifelong Learning Society, and we welcome you to the Riverside Lecture Series. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Jatifa Harris, a neurovascular and stroke specialist. Jatifa earned a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Russell Sage College in 2010. She later earned a Master of Science in Nursing from Liberty University in 2016, followed by a post-master certificate in adult gerontological acute care in 2018. Jatifa is board certified as an adult gerontological acute care nurse practitioner and a critical care registered nurse by the American Association of Critical Care Nurse Certification Corporation. She is also certified as a stroke registered nurse through the American Association of Neuroscience Nurses. Jativa has enjoyed spending the bulk of her nursing career practicing and serving as a nurse educator and clinical leader in the fields of neurocritical and pulmonary critical care medicine. Now, as a nurse practitioner, she'll be using her experience and specialized training to provide inpatient neurovascular stroke and neurointerventional care at Riverside Regional Medical Center. Passionate about practicing medicine and evaluating the quality of care for all patients, Jatifa truly enjoys taking care of patients and being a part of a patient-focused team. Born in Queens, New York and raised in Brooklyn, Jatifa and her son now enjoy Hampton Roads for its beaches, shopping, and restaurants. In her free time, she also enjoys reading, music, and traveling to new places. Today's lecture is entitled Stroke, Management and Modifiable Risk Factors. Please welcome Jatifa Harris. A bit about modifiable uh, risk factors for stroke. Like they said, I work over at Riverside Regional Medical Center, one of the nurse practitioners on the team. So I have a lot of experience uh, helping educate about these. So for today, the objectives are really gonna to be to understand what stroke is uh, and to really hone in on what the different risk factors are for stroke. We're gonna talk about identifying risk factors um, and also identifying stroke symptoms. That way, if you see it, you recognize it, you can stop it. But before we get to that, we wanna make sure that we're doing the things we can to prevent stroke in the first place. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the, the reputable sources. So stroke is the number five cause of death and leading disability in the United States and fourth cause of death in women. Every 40 seconds or every, every 40 seconds, someone suffers a stroke. Every four minutes, someone dies from a stroke. And about 800,000 people in the US have a stroke every year. About one in four strokes, nearly one in four people, if they've had a stroke, go on to have another one. So it increases your risk if you've had one stroke to have another. And 80% of strokes are preventable. So if you identify the risk factors, it could help you reduce your risk of having a stroke in the first place. 34% of patients who have a stroke or who suffer a stroke are less than 65 years old. African-Americans are twice as likely to suffer a stroke and those with a lower socioeconomic status are more likely to have a stroke as well. And that's on the national, the national uh, stand of things. But here in Virginia, it's the number four cause of death about 3,300 stroke-related deaths occur in Virginia each year, and that's about one in 20 people. Uh, every two and a half hours, someone, suffer, someone dies from a stroke, and about $880 million is spent in stroke-related in-hospital care. So that's a huge amount of money that goes into taking care of stroke patients, but the goal really is to prevent patients from having strokes in the first place. So what is a stroke? Uh, there are Three, there are two different types of strokes. There are the blockage type of strokes, which are ischemic strokes, and the bleeding type of strokes, which are, which are hemorrhagic. The blockage ones come from either a thrombus or an embolus, either a clot or a, a, a cholesterol buildup that breaks off and flies up and blocks a major artery in the brain. Sometimes the arteries are large, sometimes they're small, but either way, they can cause stroke deficits. The bleeding types of strokes, they can either bleed into the brain tissue themselves or they can bleed into the area that surrounds the brain that houses all of the blood vessels. Both of them are very, can be debilitating. Uh, more of the strokes that happen are the blockage types, about 87%, and 
and the bleeding types of strokes are about 13%. But either way, both strokes can lead to significant disability. TIAs, although not a stroke, we still look at it as a medical emergency. So TIAs give you the same types of stroke symptoms, weakness, difficulty speaking, um, visual changes, but some people dismiss it, but you still should come in when you have a TIA because it is a warning sign. It's your body's way of saying something isn't right. It sends up a smoke signal and it lets you know, get to the hospital so we can figure it out. Most people who have a TIA, about up to 20% of people who have a TIA go on to have an actual stroke within 90 days. So that's a huge amount. So we wanna always enforce that TIAs, although are not strokes, they're not many strokes. They are episodes that occur. They last sometimes seconds um, up to minutes and they can usually resolve within 24 hours. It should still be taken the same way as a stroke alert, okay? So knowing the signs of a stroke, right? Be fast is the mnemonic that we really encourage everyone to know. Be for balance. You're walking and all of a sudden you can't keep your, your feet straight or you feel like you're leaning over to one side. E is for eyes, not just eyes where vision changes, but say eyes don't look over to the left or to the right. They're focused in one direction and you can't get the person to look over to the other side. Or you have a sudden loss of you're watching television and all of a sudden you can only see half of the television screen. That is also a stroke symptom. F for face, meaning your face is asymmetric. You have a facial droop either in the lip, the eye. Um, so it doesn't have to be the whole face, but any facial asymmetry is a stroke symptom. A stands for arms, but really it means your limbs, you know, arms and legs. One is weaker than the other. You ask someone to hold up their arms and they can't maintain the, the strength on one side, or you ask them to hold up a leg and they can't hold up that leg. Again, a stroke symptom. S is for speech, not just how it sounds, but what they're able to say. So slurred speech is one, but if you ask someone something very simple, uh, what is today's date? And they answer orange. You know, it's, it sounds like confusion, but they may not be able to get the words out that they're looking for, or they speak in a word salad. So they're saying multiple words that actually don't make sense. Those are symptoms of a stroke. And if you have any one of those things, B-E-F-A-S, then you think T for time. You wanna to get to the hospital as soon as possible. Time is brain. And for every minute that goes by, we lose millions of brain cells in the process if you're having a stroke. So always like to open these talks with understanding what stroke, uh, what stroke is and how to recognize one, because if you can spot a stroke, you can stop a stroke. So what are risk factors? Risk factors are conditions or uh, things, variables that increase your risk of having a disease or a de disease developing in your body. They're modifiable and then there are non-modifiable risk factors. The modifiable ones are ones you can do something about, right? Uh, weight, diet, exercise. But the non-modifiable ones are things that none of us can change. We can't change getting older. Uh, we can't change us. Uh, uh, you know, our race, you know, so those are things that you cannot do anything about. You can't change your gender for the purposes of this. It's a non-modifiable risk factor. So non-modifiable risk factors are age, family history, race, and gender. Uh, stroke risk doubles um, in patients every 10 years after the age of 55. And so although as you get older, your risk increases of having a stroke, it doesn't mean that a stroke is a disease of the elderly. You do have patients who have strokes at a younger age, but as you get older, that risk does increase. Family history, not just the things that are considered genetic or that are passed down through genes or familial traits, but those of us know if we have family gatherings or you have very tight-knit families, you tend to have the same eating habits. You tend to have the same social environment. So those uh, recipes that are passed down from you know, age to age, from generation to generation that use all the good stuff that we love and like apple pies and cakes and, you know, the good down-home cooking, that's a familial thing, you know, people pass that down. So it's not just thinking about genetics, it's thinking about what family culture is and how that affects the, the habits moving down. Uh, race, again, we already said, increased risk in African-Americans, and that is mainly because 
African Americans are at higher risk for having hypertension. Uh, and hypertension is one of the lead, leading causes of stroke. Gender happens more often in men than in women, uh, but more women happen to die from stroke. Um, and part of that comes from the fact that we have other risk factors as a woman. You know, we, some people are on hormone replacement therapy or um, birth control pills, and we tend to live longer. So we have more likelihood of having a stroke and therefore more likelihood of dying from one. Now, the modifiable risk factors, these are the ones we're gonna focus on today because this is what we can do something about. Here is where you're in charge, along with the help of your primary care team, this is, these are the things that we really can focus on. High blood pressure, also hypertension, diabetes, smoking, your dietary habits, sedentary lifestyle, getting active, obesity, high cholesterol, atrial fibrillation, which some people will say, well, I can't do anything about the fact that I have AFib, but you can do something about the things you, the, the measures you take to stop it or to keep it under control or to protect you from a stroke. So AFib is the condition you can't do anything about. However, you can do something about the risk reduction, the stroke risk reduction that comes along with uh, AFib. Carotid and peripheral artery disease. That's the last one. So here I just put up a picture just to kind of explain one of the things that really we always talk about and that leads to stroke. And this is called atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis, if you look at the very top picture, may be a little difficult to see, is kind of an idea of what the blood vessels look like over time when they have fat plaque buildup from cholesterol. And what happens is as blood vessels get damaged over time, the cholesterol likes to deposit there. It's like it sees something that's injured and it's like a magnet, it likes to stick right there. And where you have cholesterol sticking, then more cholesterol likes to stick to it. And then if that cholesterol plaque pops or ruptures, then we have the things that are in our body that are supposed to keep things tucked away like platelets um, and clotting factors. And then they build up in that area and they can cause a blockage. That is what we're trying to prevent. Everything that we do is trying to prevent blockages and narrowing of blood vessels. When they go through this, they become stiff, they become narrow, blood can't get through them and therefore oxygen um, and the vital materials we need to supply organs in our body, they don't make it there. So looking here, um, if you look right just where the arrows are, again, this is a picture of the blood vessels uh, that go up through the back of the neck and up into the front of the head as well. Um, and you see where the arrows are pointing that show where you expect to find nice, clean pipes, you know, things just open and they're flowing and the caliber of the vessels should all look the same. And in the first one, you see where it kind of is missing and then it fills in afterwards. And the same thing with uh, the picture in the middle. And then the one all the way over uh, the right vertebral artery stenosis in, in the image C, that just shows narrowing of one vessel. And if you compare it to the one directly to the right of it, that lets you see how over time the blood vessels become narrow. When that happens, it puts you at risk for not getting blood and oxygen to the areas of the brain that you need to. And that's how people suffer a stroke. Um, and these pictures are taken by uh, MRI, MRA actually. So hypertension, 64% of patients who have a stroke have high blood pressure. It is one of the biggest risk factors in uh, stroke. It increases the force against blood, ag the force of blood against blood vessels. Uh, so if you think about a hose and you turn the pressure all the way up and you point it at something, you can think about the damage that can do like pressure washing something, right? It messes up and it removes things that should be in place. Um, and then it makes the heart have to work harder. And anything that you do that makes the heart work harder causes more risk to your body. And over time, it can damage not just the arteries and the blood vessels that supply blood to the vital organs, but it can also damage the organs themselves. So the one thing to take away from this is hypertension can cause either one of the two strokes, right? Either the blockage types of strokes, because over time, high blood pressure causes those vessels to narrow and to become stiff. And therefore, if it's narrow and stiff, you can't get blood there. But also, it can cause the bleeding type of stroke. There is only so much pressure that a blood vessel can take before it pops. And over time, if just like blowing up a balloon, you keep blowing, you keep blowing, you put a lot of pressure on there, eventually it will pop. 
And so hypertension is a risk for both the blockage and bleeding types of strokes. And here it talks about what the normal um, elevated and hypertensive crisis types of stages are. And really, some of those are going to depend on your own personal medical history, right? But for the general public, the general population, we say a blood pressure less than 130 over 80 is really where we should be aiming. And if you get into the 130s over 80s range for your blood pressure, that's, that's an indication that you're having an elevated blood pressure and you need to work with your doctor. There's some people who need to live with a higher blood pressure. If you're not one of those people, then these are the guidelines that you should be following. But everything that you do as far as managing your blood pressure should start with working with your primary care doctor. If you get to a point where your blood pressure is 140 over 80, again, now you are talking stage two hypertension. This is where you should be actively modifying your blood pressure. If you're supposed to be on medications, you take them. If you're not dieting correctly, you do that. You start exercising. And again, work with your primary care physician. When you get into numbers like 180, over 180, over 120, that is nearing, that is in the hypertensive crisis phase. And in this, you can have all kinds of things happen to you and your body. You can have the bleeding types of strokes. You can have conditions that cause dysfunction in the brain that cause you to be confused, not be able to see, not be able to think well. And again, it can cause rupture of blood vessels. So this is very, very, very important. And so the first thing you want to do, work with your primary care doctors. Ask, what should my goal be based on my health, my health risk assessment? and all of my other comorbidities, if you have them, where should I be aiming to have my blood pressure? And once they help you determine where that goal is, you work with them. Check your blood pressure at home. If you're someone who has hypertension, you wanna make sure that you're using a blood pressure cuff at home. Take your blood pressure a couple of times, keep a journal, keep a log of it. That way, when you have your appointments, you go to the doctor and you say, hey, I've noticed that in the evenings, my blood pressure tends to get up a little bit, but in the mornings, it's okay. And working to find those trends and that balance in your blood pressure make it easier for your doctor to recommend what you need to do. Getting at least 150 minutes per week of physical activity. I am not going in one day to get 150 minutes of exercise. So I like to spread mine out across the week. You can do it over three days, four days, five days. But in total, it should be about 150 minutes, not smoking. Even if you smoke a little, it's still a risk. Some people say, I only smoke one cigarette a day. Doesn't matter, any type of smoking is dangerous. And so if you are either smoking or exposed to it, that increases your risk as well. Eat a healthy diet, include um, limiting things like adding salt. Some of us love salt, lay it on there. You don't wanna do that. Um, and alcohol consumption, those two things, again, can raise your risk of uh, hypertension or raise your blood pressure directly. Uh, managing stress and medication compliance. So finding ways to relieve stress and reduce stress. And then again, working with your primary care doctor, if you have medications that you should be taking, you wanna make sure that you're taking them as prescribed. And if you notice things that are different in your body, you always work with your primary care doctor, uh, making sure that you keep your refills, right? Some patients come in and they're like, you know, I ran out and I was waiting three days to get my blood pressure medicine back. But these are the types of things you want to start working on your refills well before the time that they're due, so that way you don't run out. Diabetes, uh, uncontrolled blood sugar over a course of time. And most of the time, this is identified by finding fasting blood, blood glucose levels. So if you go get a physical and they say, you know, we want fasting labs, meaning they don't want you to have eaten overnight, and then they take them first thing in the morning. And if that number is greater than 126, that is a risk for stroke. That means you are, not, that is a risk for stroke. And that also means that you are going into the diabetes phase. Um, what this does is it causes a buildup in the blood and prevents oxygen, oxygen and nutrients from getting places. If you think about um, things, if you are making like sweet tea or something where you add other things into the mix of it, the more sugar you put in there, the thicker it becomes. It becomes more like a syrup. And things don't move well when they're thick like syrup. And that's the same thing you have to think about in your blood vessels, in your blood. Um, if you reduce the sugar or you make it to where it's the appropriate levels that your body needs and not extra, uh, then it does not cause blood and oxygen to have a hard time getting to the places that it needs. There are two types of diabetes. There's type one and there's type two. Type one diabetics, there's nothing that they can do about it, right? This is sometimes... Um, 
an unprovoked event that causes their body not to make insulin. And how diabetes works is you have a high blood sugar or you have blood sugar, you have sugar in your blood. Insulin helps to move that sugar into the places that it needs to go, right? So some people either don't produce insulin or they don't produce enough insulin for the blood that's there, for the sugar that's there. And if there's more sugar than insulin, then you end up with diabetes, okay? This will increase fatty deposits in the blood vessels. And like we, show, we displayed in the slide there, those fatty deposits lay along the sides of the blood vessels and they cause narrowing and things that should not be there start to stick to those. And then you end up with a stroke. And people who have diabetes are twice as likely to have a stroke. And so that's why you wanna make sure that you are doing the things you have to do to reduce that number. Whether you're a type one or type two, you need to work again with your primary care doctor to make sure your blood glucose stays under control. So again, work with your primary care doctor. If you are diabetic, diabetic or pre-diabetic, you start implementing things like healthy diet and exercise. If they recommend taking medications, either oral or injectable, you do that. And then you work with them because over time, if you are someone who can really modify your diabetes with diet and exercise, those may not be permanent interventions. Medications may not be a permanent option for you if you can get them under control, but if not, and you need the medication, we do. One of the things that you will see if you're getting physicals is checking an A1C. And the A1C is a snapshot of what your blood sugar has done over about 120 days. So when you go and you get just a finger stick or you get blood work done for the day and it says, hey, your blood glucose is this, that's great. But we really want to see the trend over time. And the higher the A1C, that gives us a clue that your blood sugar is uncontrolled for, a long, for that 120 days prior to that test. The goal is to have, for people who are diabetic, the goal is to have an A1C less than seven. For people who are not diabetic, we try to aim less than 6.7. Um, and again, those are checked usually annually for most people if you're getting your physicals. But when you start seeing that number creep up, that gives you an idea that something is not right and we need to work on your blood sugar management. Again, don't smoke, maintain a healthy weight. Uh, when we start talking about weight, it's uh, BMI. You know, there you go and they based on your height and your weight um, and a BMI greater than 29, 28, 29 lets you, puts you in the obese phase. Um, I don't really like that, but <laughs> that's where we are. And so when you have an elevated BMI, then you start to think about how weight impacts uh, diabetes risk. And usually those who are overweight usually have a diet that is high in fat and sugar. And so it all plays a part in it. Limit alcohol. Alcohol just has a lot of empty calories and a lot of sugar in there. So if you're someone who drinks frequently, that may be lending to your uncontrolled diabetes. And then stress management. I don't know about anyone else, when I'm stressed, I do not say like, let me go get this big bowl of salad. You know, like that is not, <laughs> that is not my thing. So it's usually, let me go and get, you know, a nice bowl of ice cream or a piece of candy. And honestly, if you're not, if you are a stress eater, that does lend to risk of diabetes. So really keeping your, your stress under control is, is very helpful. Uh, high cholesterol. So this is one of the, the, the big ones, right? So we talked about high blood pressure. We talked about diabetes, but high cholesterol. This comes from either an unhealthy diet. There are patients who have familial traits that pass down high cholesterol. So you may be doing everything that you're supposed to and your cholesterol is still not controlled, but you have a family history of it. Um, and hypertension and diabetes also cause um, elevated cholesterol levels comes from eating diets with too much saturated fat, and it does cause stiffened, stiffened and narrowed blood vessels, um, again, called atherosclerosis. And so if you look at the picture, all of that yellow you see is what happens inside of the blood vessels. It's the deposits of cholesterol that are not supposed to be there. And as they get there, then more deposits on it. It's like a magnet. It's like, hey guys, we found a good space to lay. Come on, we need more of you here. And if you keep the circulating levels of cholesterol in your body pretty high, then they keep going to the space where their friends are for the most part. So if you limit the amount of cholesterol that you have in your body, you really can't do anything about past cholesterol levels, right? But you, what you can do is reduce the amount of cholesterol you add to that plaque right there. Blood vessels really should look like the one you see on the left. They're nice and they're smooth on the inside. 
But over time with high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, it does add to the buildup there. And as things build up, things get narrow, blood doesn't get where it's supposed to go, you end up with a stroke. So answer is kind of there, but is all cholesterol bad for you? Does anybody think? Is all cholesterol bad? No, good, all right. That is a myth. You need some good cholesterol. There's two types. There's the LDL and there's the HDL, right? So LDL, low density, HDL, high density. What you want is to keep that LDL number low because the LDL is the bad cholesterol. That is the cholesterol that does not clean up after itself. It takes the cholesterol that your body needs for cell function in your body um, to create bile in your, in your gut to help break down fat soluble things. But it goes and it takes cholesterol, it takes it to where it needs to go. And then once it's all used up, whatever is left, it leaves it. Doesn't pick it up, says, I'm gonna leave this mess right here. And they end up in your blood vessels where they're not supposed to be. So you want to reduce the amount of LDL because they don't clean up after themselves. If I have untidy guests in my house, I really don't want that many of them there. So you think of them like LDL, okay? Then you have HDL. That's the high density one. This is the good, this is the good cholesterol. You want to make sure that your HDL is high because it goes through and it takes all of the excess, all of the stuff that the LDL left behind and takes it back to the liver to be to get rid of, right? So they're the cleanup truck for the most part. So you wanna do things that are gonna increase HDL, decrease LDL. So eat in diets that are um, high in fibers, vegetables like broccoli, um, and low in things like saturated fats. Avoid meats that are not lean. Red meats are high um, in cholesterol. You wanna do things that are gonna find a balance. Things like grains, whole grains, they help increase the good, um, cholesterol. Regular exercise, again, 150 minutes per week, however you decide to divide it up is up to you. Stress management, smoking cessation, medication compliance, and statins. Uh, statins are those things like uh, torvastatin, uh, Havachol, um, and there's about four or five different ones, but sometimes what happens is people take a statin and they get body aches. You know, it's a common occurrence or a common side effect of statin therapy. And so there are different ones that you can try, again, working with your primary care doctor. But if you take a statin and you get body aches, you let your doctor know, they try different ones. And sometimes you have to try all of them before you find one that works. And sometimes none of them work. But when that happens, it's gonna be even more important to work on diet, exercise, uh, modifying, your other risk factors like diabetes and high blood pressure to make sure that your blood, that your blood cholesterol comes down. And like I said, the goal is not to re get rid of the, the, the cholesterol that's been deposited in the past. The goal is to make sure that it doesn't continue to build up, right? So over the course of your life, you have eaten things and had extra cholesterol in your body and there's different little deposits everywhere. But as you get older and more risk factors are compounded, you want to make sure that you're reducing the amount of cholesterol that sticks to those areas that are already there. And so this table here just really talks about what we said already, your LDL, your total cholesterol, and your HDL. So really the goal for LDL is less than 100. If you've had a stroke or you have significant cardiovascular risk factors, that number really we, go, we aim for less than 70. But less than 100 is optimal. If you're at 99, we'll, we'll take it. But if you're at 65, we love it. Um, for total cholesterol, we really want it to stay less than 200. Um, if it's 200 to 230, then it's borderline. Anything greater than 240, you really should be focusing on how to get that number down. And then HDL, you want that number to be greater than 60. That is the good one. You want the cleanup trucks to be there a lot and the untidy visitors to be there, to be there less. That makes sense. Uh, diet and exercise. So, eating a nutritious and balanced diet, you want to make sure you have diets that are less saturated in fats and no processed foods, things that come in packages or frozen uh, preserves for later use. Those ones tend to be full of fat and full of the things that we really don't want in our body. You want more fruits and vegetables and foods that are found in their more natural state. Uh, so, broccoli, beans 
grains, those are all ones that are good for you. Avoiding white uh, bread and trying more things like whole wheat bread. Uh, focus on soluble fiber, like we said, grains, beans, and vegetables. Stay active, 150 minutes per week. You can divide that however you want, 30 minutes over five days, uh, three days worth of 50 minutes. I can't say that I'm going to do that, but you can do it however you want, but the goal should be a cumulative amount of 150 minutes. And avoid drinking too much alcohol, which can raise your blood pressure. Again, some people just avoid it altogether, but you want to try it in moderation. Men, they say two drinks a day. Women, one a day. To me, I will just say avoid it. If you um, resources like Live to the Beat. Uh, found this really great resource. It's recommended through the CDC. It's live to the beat, either .org or .com. But either way, this website here gives you resources to control all the risk factors. It gives you tips on how to eat more healthy, how to incorporate more diet and exercise. It sends you links and you can download apps to your phone to help track what you're doing and track your weight. And when you have resources like this, you always wanna use reputable sources. You don't wanna use Dr. Google, you wanna use things like the American Heart Association, um, the CDC, and things that like the NIH, you wanna make sure that you are using resources that really have had founded research to support it. Things that we Google are not always up to date. Up to date is another website. But I would say if you ever have questions about stroke management, risk reduction, you go to places like CDC, you start there, and then any link that they'll have there is typically reputable for you. But I think that this website here, Live to the Beat, was an excellent one for people who just want basic information for themselves. Smoking. Okay. Doubles the risk of death if you have a stroke. So not only does it increase your risk of having a stroke, it doubles the risk that you're gonna die from it, right? And we've already explained that 80% of strokes are preventable. And so you have a stroke and now you go into having an increased risk from dying from it. If you smoke one pack per day, which is about 20 cigarettes in most packs, you're six times more likely to have a stroke than somebody who does not. And so if you just scale that across people who maybe smoke two packs a day or half a pack, even then your risk is still increased. The chemicals in cigarettes, they just damage the cells in your body. They, they cause breakdown, they cause inflammation, they cause narrowing, and they cause it to happen at an increased speed. So we have patients who come in and they are like, I am compliant with everything, right? I'm taking my blood pressure medicine. I have my diabetes under control. I am working out five days a week. And then I ask, are you still smoking? They're like, oh yeah, you know, trying to cut down. But it doesn't work that way. It's no point in doing all of the other things if you're not gonna do it all. This is an all or nothing type of thing, right? You do a little bit, not the main things, it's a problem, right? So smoking, it increases your blood pressure, it increases your cholesterol, and it increases the risk of clot development. And again, if we think back to that slide that I showed you where the, the plaque was there and then the blood vessels started sticking to it, so not only are you increasing the rate at which that plaque builds up, you're increasing the likelihood that the, the clots, the blood, the clotting factors like platelets will stick to it, okay? That is also a problem. So another resource here, Quit Now Virginia Tobacco Quit My, right? 1-800-QUIT-NOW. This is a wonderful resource for anyone who wants to quit smoking. They will help you set up with a coach, uh, with someone who will help you stay accountable for what you're doing. There are many tobacco replacements like nicotine and nicotine patches, Nicorette gum. Um, but really some people feel like I'm just gonna wean myself off of smoking, right? But again, we've already explained 20 cigarettes, 10 cigarettes, two cigarettes, the risk is still there, just increases with the more you smoke. The goal really should be as hard as it is, cold turkey. Um, and that more people who go cold turkey from smoking, they are more successful with quitting than people who wean over a longer period of time. So I would say, again, if you smoke, don't. If you're trying to quit, keep at it. Um, use resources, get help, work with your primary care doctor. And these resources through Virginia Quitline are typically free or they help um, uh, with some of the costs and get you set up. And if you're in the hospital, we get you set up with those things as well. Okay. So medications, insulin and oral antidiabetic medications are ones that we would use to control diet. 
everything is going to have to start with working with your primary care doctor. You never want to make, take, or change any um, plan to your, your medication without speaking to the person who's primarily caring for you. So I can give you this information here as a general uh, medical expert, right? But I don't know each and every one of your uh, medical history per se. So you can take this as a good pearl of knowledge and go to your PCP and work on the things that you need to work on. Blood pressure medications, also known as antihypertensive, these medications work to help get your blood pressure in a normal range. Medications are not always the answer, but a lot of times they help us along the way until we can make sure we adjust other things that will help us maybe not have to stay on them. Some people need them. Again, along with the medication, just monitoring your overall health status to know if you need to make any adjustment. Uh, heart rate and rhythm control medications. This is when AFib, when we talked about AFib. And so we can't control that we have AFib. It is an irregular quivering of the top chambers of the heart that cause clots to develop there. If a clot develops in the heart because of that, it can shoot out of the heart and cause you to have a blockage type of stroke in the brain, or actually in any organ, but for this talk, it's in the brain for stroke. And so what you wanna do are be on medications that either control the rhythm, that keep you in a normal rhythm so that the heart doesn't quiver and it doesn't have time to develop clots. But you also wanna control, have things that control rate so that the heart doesn't have to work as hard. People who have AFib that is uncontrolled, tend to go into heart failure because the heart is really trying to compensate for it not working well. If you are running a race at you know, 150 <laughs> steps per minute versus 50, you don't get tired as fast. You, know, you can kind of sustain a little bit more energy and that's the same way we have to think about it with the heart. And if you are on, if you do have a history of AFib based on again, your own health assessment and your own risk factors, you may be recommended to be on things like blood thinners. Uh, some types of blood thinners we use are aspirin, Plavix, Lenta. Those are antiplatelets. They keep clots from kind of sticking together. And then actual blood thinners like Eliquis, Xarelto, Pradaxa. These are all medications that help reduce risks of clots developing in your body. And I know um, here there's always this great debate about aspirin, right? A couple of months ago, back in April, all over the news that aspirin was no longer recommended for stroke risk reduction or for, general, for taking it generally. But there was a caveat to that, right? If you have an increased risk and that's you working with your primary care doctor to look at risk factors like age, um, heart disease, history of stroke, history of heart attack, when they look at all of these things combined, they give you a, a 10 year risk assessment, meaning in the next 10 years, what is your percentage or likelihood of developing any kind of cardiovascular disease that includes the heart and of the brain. And if you have a high risk of that and you're less than 60 years old, then it would be recommended for you to be on aspirin. If you are somebody who does not have a high risk assessment and you're over 60, that is when they were saying you don't really have to take it, right? If you don't have a risk and you haven't been recommended by your primary care doctor to be on one, then it's not necessary to take it. Several years back, they were saying, nope, everybody take aspirin to protect yourself. And then everyone was taking aspirin and ended up with gastric ulcers, ulcers of the stomach, right? So that is why they went back to evaluate that. So now when that, when that information came out, everyone got scared. They're like, patients were coming into the hospital. I haven't been taking my aspirin. The news said not to. Well, you've had a stroke in the past, right? So that increases your risk. You've had a heart attack in the past. That increases your risk. You have stents in your heart. That increases your risk. And when you have that type of risk assessment compounded with age, then that is the recommendation for you to be on aspirin. So always take direction of your blood thinners, of your medications from your primary care doctor, because even the people on the TV, they may be reputable, right? Depending on where they're getting their information from, but they don't know you. So you always wanna take that information back and run it past the person who knows you well. Um, nicotine patches, nicotine gum, smoking cessation, the quit hotline, all things that help reduce your risk of stroke via smoking. So I'll reiterate that whether you smoke one cigarette, five cigarettes, 20 cigarettes in a day, it all is a risk. So you want to do your best to go cold turkey if you can, um, because those people who go cold turkey are um, more successful in their quitting. Stress and mental health. So stress causes increased cortisol levels. Uh, people who are typically under stress, cortisol increases fat deposits in places that it shouldn't be. 
Um, it is responsible for a lot of the weight that people gain in their midsection. That's where cortisol and fat deposits like to live. Um, it can cause digestive issues, increased blood pressure and vessel inflammation. And again, if things are inflamed, they are not in their optimal state. Things that shouldn't be there that, that like to stick to damaged areas like cholesterol, they will stick there. So you wanna do things that reduce your stress levels. And if you wanna reduce your stress, you can do something that already will help reduce your risk of stroke by exercising. You know? I know when I get up and exercise before I go to work in the morning, I feel way more productive. I feel um, more alert. I feel healthier. I feel sharper. And so it has better, um, it has a lot of benefits, not just for reducing your risk of stroke, but for overall stress management. Build a healthy support system. You're not in it alone, right? You have lots of care team members, not just on the medical health staff, but care managers, social workers. Um, there are a lot of resources in the general public. If you know how to get to them, they will help support you through managing your life's um, stressors and your health conditions. Get adequate sleep. You know, as I know, I've been told as people get older, they tend not to sleep as well. Um, but really your body needs the rest. You have to give your time, your body time to rejuvenate, to rest, to recover from the days before. And getting adequate sleep is better for you and it's good for brain health. Maintain balance and boundaries. Right. You know, don't overextend yourself. You know, it's great to stay active, but you don't have to do it seven days a week. If you can, that's great. But you want to do things that, you know, it's OK to say no sometimes, you know, say, hey, you know what? This is my day of rest. I'm going to do that um, and identify and maintain hobbies. If you like to run, if you like to knit, if you like to shop, <laughs> go out to eat, you know, do things that make you feel good in balance. Right. Um, and the whole goal is really to make your mental health better. If you're in a better mental state, then you can take care of the rest of your body. Your, your mental health is no different than the health of your body. You're making sure your diabetes and hypertension, high cholesterol is in order. You still want to do the same thing about your mental health. It still requires the same kind of care and attention that regular organs in your body does. So in conclusion, 80% of all strokes are preventable. You can be in control of the things you can modify. You can't modify age, gender, uh, family history, race. Those are things as when it comes to uh, risk that we can't really do much about. But we can do a lot about the things that are modifiable. We can do things about your blood pressure. We can do things about your blood glucose, your blood sugar. We can do things about stress, smoking. All of these things we are in control of. And the more you take control of to live in a healthier state, the, more, the less likely you are to have a stroke. Everything we talked about, um, I see it every day. I do it in practice every day, but I don't, again, know you. So if you find that you've related to any of this information, you take that back to your primary care doctor and find a plan that helps you, okay? And take this information and share it to people like, hey, you know, I heard today that if you do this, it will help you. So this information is intended to help the people who are tuning in, but to help you help others who weren't. Okay, and it's me, uh, see me in person, but um, again, my name is Jay Harris, it's Jatifa, um, for everyone else on the, at work, um, and I'm one of the neurovascular, neurointervention, and stroke neurology specialists. So I am an acute care nurse practitioner who is certified in adult gerontological medicine. Um, so yeah, so that is the end of my presentation, and if there are any questions, Let's take them now. Yes. What? Oh, that's a really good question. So some of the signs of AFib, I'll tell you, lots of people go into in and out of AFib and have no clue, right? Most sometimes it's just a happenstance. They come into the hospital, complain of one thing, we put them on the monitor and we find that they have AFib. But there are some people who are like, you know what? I was feeling more fatigued over the last couple of weeks and I couldn't figure out why, you know, I just did not have the energy to do anything. And again, it's because your heart is working much harder than it has to. And so it can't keep up with its normal pace. Um, some people describe it as palpitations, you know, feeling like fluttering in your chest. And some people write it off, right? They're like, oh, I was having a stressful day. My heart was beating too fast. Or, you know, I was uh, carrying all these groceries up the stairs and I just, you know, felt my heart race for a little bit and it settled down after a while. Um, sometimes chest pain, 
Um, if you are somebody who is in AFib for a long time and it goes undetected, you can go into heart failure. So you can start having things like unusual swelling in your legs because blood isn't pumping out of your heart the way that it needs to. But the more common ones that people experience are fatigue, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, and general feelings of unwellness. Recognize AFib. So are there any tests that we could do to recognize AFib? Uh, EKGs, which is the electrical monitoring of your heart. If you come in and you have any of the, the symptoms or things that you feel um, are just not quite right, we can get an EKG. But remember, some, in some patients, AFib comes and goes, right? So we can take a snapshot picture of what's happening electrically with your heart, but that doesn't mean that that's the only time that it happens. It's like, um, one of the doctors I work with, Dr. Ramakrishnan, she always says, it's like trying to take a picture of lightning, right? We know that lightning strikes, but we don't always know when it's going to happen. If you take a picture outside, it may or may not catch it, but you're more likely to catch it in the middle of the storm, right? So if you feel things happening and we can take that picture, then we're more likely to catch AFib happening. Some patients, we recommend them do, um, we, rec we refer them to cardiology and they do things like extended heart monitoring. So either over 24, 72, um, 24 or 72 hours. And for patients, we really are concerned about them having this condition. We may do heart monitors up to seven days and even up to 30 days. And with that, it gives you constant picture taking. It's like recording a video of what's happening of your heart. And more likely then you're able to capture something that comes and goes. Uh, for some patients who come into the hospital, if they have had a short-term heart monitor place um, and we don't find it, and we're really still not figuring out why they had their stroke, we may sometimes recommend doing an implantable one. And it's a little chip the size of like a paper clip, slides right under the skin, right under the skin over your heart, and it can stay in place for about three to five years, and it monitors over a long period of time. And so the whole goal is to capture lightning. So that's typically what we do. Yeah. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Whether it's a TIA or a stroke. So TIAs are like Again, you have the same stroke symptoms. You may experience weakness on one side, difficulty speaking, uh, your vision goes out for a minute, you feel unsteady on your feet, but you notice that it comes and then it goes within about 24 hours. Most of the time it lasts minutes, you know, sometimes seconds, minutes, hours. Um, but most of the time, if it's a TIA, those symptoms resolve within 24 hours. That's usually one of the first clues. But the other thing that a TIA doesn't do is leave behind evidence, right? It's like, um, having someone break into your house, the alarm goes off, right? So they run out and they don't take anything, right? So you know someone was there because the alarm went off, but they didn't take anything. So there's no evidence of the theft, right? Same thing with TIA. Happens, something is wrong in your body, sends off an alarm, you get weak, you have a difficulty speaking, you have any of the stroke symptoms, but then we do an MRI and we don't find any evidence of the stroke, right? It's none there. Right? So the body set off an alarm, but it was able to get rid of whatever was causing the symptoms in the first place, but it didn't leave the, the evidence behind on picture. So when we look at an MRI, we can see whether you've had a stroke now versus strokes in the past, and we don't see the one that happened now. So if you have stroke-like symptoms and a negative MRI and the symptoms go away within 24 hours, that's usually a TIA. If it leaves evidence behind when we take the pictures of the, of the brain using an MRI or a CAT scan, but most of the time on an MRI, if it leaves evidence behind, it's a stroke. Okay. No? No more online? You're very welcome. Look at that insoluble thing. Thank you, thank you, thank you.